Welcome to Coffee and Conflict, a National Security Institute podcast, where I'll be sitting down with leading authors and experts every fortnight to discuss some of the most recent works and the bigger picture of national security, foreign policy, and intelligence issues. I'm your host, Joshua Heminski, a senior fellow at the National Security Institute and senior vice president at the Center for the Study of the Presidency and Congress. This season, we'll be covering topics ranging from the war in Ukraine, 21st century defense strategy, and the intensifying strategic competition between the United States and China, and more. So grab your first or second coffee of the day, and let's crack on with the discussion. Today, I'm joined by Anna Arutunian and Mark Galliotti, authors of Downfall, Purgosian, Putin, and the New Fight for the Future of Russia. Anna is a Russian-American journalist, analyst, and author. Born in Moscow, she was raised and educated in the United States before returning to Russia as a journalist. She covered two decades of Russian politics, first as a reporter and editor at the Moscow News, then as a correspondent and analyst. She has served as Russia's senior analyst for the International Crisis Group and only left Russia after the February 2022 invasion. She's the author of several books on Russia, including The Putin Mystique and the latest on Russia's war in Ukraine, Hybrid Warriors, Proxies, Freelancers, and Moscow's Struggle for Ukraine. Professor Mark Galliotti is an expert in modern Russia, especially security, politics, and intelligence services, and criminality. As well as running the consultancy Mayak Intelligence, he's an honorary professor at the University College London School of Slavonic and Eastern European Studies, a senior non-resident fellow of the Institute of International Relations in Prague, and an associate fellow at the Council on Geostrategy. As if that was not enough, he's a prolific author. His most recent books include Putin's Wars, The Weaponization of Everything, We Need to Talk About Putin, The Vori, Russia's Super Mafia, and the forthcoming book Forged in War, A New Military History of Russia. He is also the host of the peerless podcast source of all things Russia and Moscow's Shadows. Once again, I'm unsure of the rules of endorsing others' podcasts on my own, but it's a personal favorite of mine. It really needs to find a home on your queue. So with that, Anna and Mark, welcome to Coffee and Conflict. Thank you. Uh, We're going to be talking about Downfall and Purgosian, which is an absolutely fantastic book. I have my copy here. I could not wait for it to come out in the United States, and I believe it's going to be coming out shortly here. I actually ordered it from Waterstones. I was so excited about it. But what made you decide to write a book about Purgosian, and how did this project come about? Um, I'm, I'm going to say just a few words, but I actually like for Mark to, uh, to, to take this one. Um, we'd both been getting uh, uh, requests to deal with this figure. Um, this was when he was still alive and actually before the mutiny. And at first we were actually quite torn on whether, you know, this, is, this was something that merited a, a whole book. Um, but basically, given given our um, our own backgrounds, we decided that you know there's a lot of material here in the story of Prigozhin that allowed us really to look at the Russian uh, system under Putin, and precisely you know this relationship between uh, the state and private actors. So ultimately, you know, we we decided to 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 write it, to write it both of us because it was you know. Um, it was a way to really pool our uh, respective uh, strengths together into this project. Yeah, exactly. It takes quite a bit to take on after all a project for someone who is so deeply, deeply unpleasant as Prigozhin. Because if you're writing a biography, in some ways you have to crawl to a to a certain degree at least into their skin and 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 sort of wander through the various dark chasms of their brains. And, yeah, for both of us, there was that sense of, do we really want to actually commit ourselves to that? Until, as Anna said, we we thought, well, actually, Prigozhin himself as a human being may not merit, well, never mind a book, but just that particular sort of chunk of our lives, but to use Prigozhin as a way of explaining how the Putin system evolved and the degree to which, you know, we tend to look at the oligarchs, the, the big beasts of the Putin system, but actually... It's the minigarchs, it's the autocrats like Prigozhin, who in many ways are the absolute backbone of the Putin state. These much less well-known figures who nonetheless are sitting there, if they play the game correctly, if they anticipate what the Kremlin needs, they can become rich and powerful. But they have to keep doing so, because they're not Putin's friends. You know, Prigozhin was not a, a friend of Putin's. He'd have known Putin a long time, but he wasn't a friend. These are sharks who have to keep swimming or they drown. And that really helps explain a lot of the dynamics of the Putin system. Of course, then, we, literally two weeks after we signed the contract to do the book, the mutiny happened, and suddenly things became a lot more immediate and a lot more pressing, and the publishers were more or less saying, no, guys, can you write it in a month? No, I'm, I'm slightly <laughs> exaggerating, but nonetheless, things became more timely. And then, of course, 
Prigozhin died, which also helped expedite the process. I mean, on the one hand, in entirely solipsistic terms, I know I was thinking, oh, is this good for us or bad for us? Um, but it also, in some ways, unlocked things, because you know, one of the things that Prigozhin, it's worth saying, you know, was, was distinctly... Well, I don't want to say secretive or private, because he went on social media a lot and let everyone know his views, but certainly his, his, his own business life and his family life was something he was exceedingly protective about. And there was one journalist whom you mentioned in the book who had contacted Prigozhin's press team and said, well, I just would like, like, a, like, like to write a profile. And they said no. And, and he said, and she said, oh, come on, guys, it's just a really vanilla, straightforward profile. And they said, look, if you go ahead with this, at one point you'll be, your car will be driven off the road in, into a forest, and if you're lucky, you'll be raped. As you can imagine, she did not write the profile. But, you know, when, when, when that is your, your PR team, as you can imagine, while he was still alive, there were people who were not willing to talk and so forth. So it was, a, it was an interesting project, um, and which became that much more timely and that much more pressing once we started writing it. I mean, you referenced the, the difficulty about writing about Prigozhin just because of the, the violence and intimidation that he had. Did you find any challenges? Obviously, you signed the, the contract two weeks before the mutiny. Did you find any difficulties in, in writing the book, and the unwillingness of people to respond or any pushback from sort of his and his team? Well, or was he otherwise person. occupied? Well, I mean, I think by that point also he had broken cover. I mean, remember, this is a guy who for most of certainly the, the period of the um, Wagner mercenary army claimed he had nothing to do with it. Likewise, he claimed he had nothing to do with the infamous troll factories which are involved in, amongst other projects, you know, messing with the American elections. But by that, by that time, he had been in a position in which he could begin to sort of publicly boast about his role there. So that particular taboo had been lifted. But also, I mean, yes, there's, there's you know, his own statements. I mean, Anna being that much more um, you know, sort of connected and embedded within within Moscow circles was obviously had her own connections. But I think one thing that is worth saying that I think generally is, is, is not really fully taken on board. Yes, Putin's Russia has become increasingly authoritarian, increasingly unwilling to allow independence of media, but there's still a lot of independence within the media there are still people who are willing to run the risk of being sacked or beaten or worse to carry out investigative journalism. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's quite inspiring that, that there is still, even in, in the middle of this sort of totalitarian re regime, not quite totalitarian, there's the academic pedant in me. Um, you know, but so, so actually, one of the things we, we could draw on was there was actually a lot of really good work being done by Russians inside Russia as well. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, oh, sorry, no, I just, uh, just to really, you know, quickly add, we, you know, the people we uh, did talk to uh, for this book, uh, I mean, obviously, we took a lot of precautions, we didn't want to endanger them or um, ourselves, myself, I'm, a, you know, I, I'm still, I, I'm, I, I remain Russian. <laughs> regardless of anything. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, I, I think it's just, you know, careful um, interplay of like, you know, just certain certain precautions you take, but also triangulating that with um, the a lot of the open source material and just simply understanding where the sources, whether they're people you talk to or uh, people in the media, where they, they themselves are coming from and what they bring to this particular story. I want to start first talk about Prigozhin, the, the man himself, because he comes from, as you write, a relatively modest, you know, middle class esque, by Soviet standards, background, almost becoming an athlete, and goes into the restaurateur business and ends up as a warlord. That is a very curious arc of uh, personal and professional growth. Uh, how did this come about? I mean, how did he go from that to becoming, you know, marching on, attempting uh, a mutiny in Moscow? Well, I don't know if you want to. <laughs> it's not, 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 not the best response, but that's what the book, uh, re read the book to find out. But, um, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, uh, it, it is, it, there are a lot of um, really interesting, um, maybe somewhat paradoxes that, you know, this is, 
you would think that this is, uh, you, you think of your, you know, stereotypical criminal who comes from a broken home and deprivation and all of these things. Actually, um, you know, this, he, he comes from a modest home, but it wasn't entirely impoverished. Uh, his, uh, his mother was a doctor. Uh, this is a cer certain, there's a certain social strata in the Soviet Union at the time, the intelligentsia, which, uh, they, they lived, they lived modestly, but they basically had their, their needs met. Uh, the trouble was that you couldn't really break out of that strata. You couldn't make more money, um, as a doctor or as a, you know, as a, as a member of the intelligentsia class. Uh, and yet you were surrounded by people in the nomenclature, uh, you know, the, 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 the factory directors who were clearly living beyond their means and beyond their salary. So there's this, you know, curious disparity um, that you started to recognize uh, that you could not legally have nice things in life. And for somebody like Prigozhin, and this is where I think his, the personal aspect comes in, is that this was a man, I think, who... who his parents placed expectations on him. He placed expectations upon himself, but he could never really quite get that, do that, achieve that. And, you know, he, he fell in with the wrong crowd uh, before college, started committing crimes, and there he was, suddenly a criminal. This was the way to get the nice things he wanted. But in some ways, that was actually the making of Prigozhin. Exactly, he, you know, he had tried to be a professional athlete. He was good, but not quite good enough. He was quite intelligent and bookish, but not quite good enough to get into one of the elite universities that would open a path into the party elite. But when he went to prison, that's in some ways where he truly discovered that he has, particularly, I would say, two great strengths. One is he's, he was an entrepreneur. He was a deal maker. And the other one was that he was... How can I put it, if I, a little bit euphemistically, not afraid of violence, not afraid of intimidation. He could operate in that environment. I remember this is a guy who, in, I mean, he, he, was, he trans, at his own request, transferred to a logging camp within the penal system. Remember, the Russian penal system is really based around sort of, I call them labor camps, which makes, makes it sound a little bit too Stalinist, but nonetheless, the camps in which people did activity. And inside that camp, he set up his first business arranging other inmates to take off cuts and fashion them into just little knickknacks and souvenirs, which could then be smuggled out of the prison to be sold to tourists and the like. And to do that, he had to reach deals with both the, the gangsters who actually ran the prison inside and the, the prison guards who controlled the, the, the outer perimeter and controlled access to and from those markets outside. So, you know, even while he was in prison, he discovered both his talents... And so when he came out into a Soviet Union that was on the verge of collapse, and then Russia went, went through the, the, the so-called wild 90s, a period of, sort of anarchic transition to a kind of bastardized capitalism, this was almost the perfect environment for someone like him. Because you're right, ambition, enterprise, cunning, and a willingness to use violence and threats would be essential to prospering in this world, and Prigozhin had them all. So it seems that he was very much the right skill set at the right time for the right environment. Uh, is that really what kind of got him to where on the path that he was going on to? I would have thought so, and particularly also his capacity to identify who he could afford to intimidate or ignore, but who also he needed to cultivate. Because, you know, one of the elements of the book is that we intertwine his story and his evolution with, with that of Putin. Again, a man who sort of missed out on the optimistic period of perestroika under Gorbachev, the reforms, and came back to a country in ruins. And, you know, whereas Prigozhin is a sort of more classic economic entrepreneur, Putin became a bureaucratic entrepreneur, using his position, particularly in St. Petersburg mayor's office, to feather his own nest and build his own contacts. And he was exactly the kind of person whom Prigozhin cultivated. They certainly met earlier than the sort of official story and in that context, you know, it, it is exactly the t that this was the time, as you say, that, 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 that Prigozhin was, would had all the right skill set. And it was also a time in which political entrepreneurs like Putin were looking for their own allies and other people who could pay them off to allow them to sort of build up their own 
treasure chests. So it was a match made, certainly not in heaven, but somewhere or other. I want to build off of that because it, it's a fascinating dynamic, and you write about in the book about the, the relationship between Putin and Prigozhin. What does that relationship and dynamic stay, say? Excuse me about the relationship and the dynamic between the state and business within Russia, particularly over that period of time, but then certainly in, in the Putin era. Um, I think this is a very important um, issue that uh, says that. In, in some ways, I, I would say defines the, the, the Putin era, but actually has its roots in the 1990s. And that issue is the issue of the weak state uh, that has to rely on uh, private business uh, to meet state goals. Uh, this is a situation that developed by accident uh, in, the, in the ruins of the Soviet Union, um, when uh, basically you had... Um, you had a very uh, weak government. The Yeltsin government was basically in disarray. Society was in disarray. Um, and what what you saw happening is you had a whole cohort of, uh, you know, former security officers from the KGB, like Vladimir Putin, uh, who really didn't have a place in society. Uh, but in, the, uh, in a situation where you had uh, really no new laws to replace the, 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 the system that had just collapsed, and you had suddenly all this private capital, go, uh, private business and private entrepreneurship going on, you had chaos and crime. You needed, uh, in, in, instead of a government, you needed brokers uh, to kind of fill in, fill in the space, and those brokers uh, increasingly uh, turned out to be people like Vladimir Putin, former KGB officers, um, the, new, the, the newly renamed FSB. Um, I mean, th there was a lot of scope for corruption. This was a very corrupt uh, system, but it came in some ways out of necessity. Um, and I think that pattern of relations continued on after Putin became president, even with his whole uh, talk of the dictatorship of the law, his crackdown on crime, on chaos. That um, inclination to lean on private actors where the state failed, it provided them, the Putin regime, with, uh, first of all, it was, it's like it allowed them to, to use other people's capital to, to fulfill state needs, but also it provided a, a degree of deniability. In other words, if, if, uh, if our efforts fail to do what we want to do, we can always blame it on these people who were actually the ones tasked with doing it. And this is a pattern that persisted during in the early Putin years as a kind of a business strategy for you know building the kind of state capitalism that uh, that developed under Putin, but later on to also wage his wars, as we saw in uh, Ukraine, when Russia kind of didn't want to get in there in, in 2014, but kind of did, and so it like it wasn't really sure what it wanted to do, so let's just see what, what these private guys um, end up achieving, and then we'll see. I wonder if we can take a step back and, and sort of seat this dynamic, and I'm curious if there is uh, any parallel, but within the broader arc of, of Russian history, the dynamic between the parallel institutions and the leveraging of entrepreneurs, adventurers, mercenaries, and things along those lines, is there a uh, precedent before certainly the post-Soviet environment and then the uh, Putin era for this dynamic? Uh, yes, yes, there absolutely is. I am just in the process of uh, actually revising my next book, which is called Rebel Russia. Sorry, it's not. This is not to uh, deflect from downfall, but well, actually, one example I have of uh, a rebel is Emilian Pugachev, uh, the former Cossack who led a, a led a rebellion in um, the 18th century. Uh, this, uh, and I actually compare him to uh, Prigozhin. Uh, I, 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 I. I I really see a parallel here because what you had is a state leaning on the Cossack community uh, to fight its wars. And uh, Pugachev, as many Cossacks became disgruntled with uh, basically having to do the state's dirty work, but not, but you know, still facing oppression and being treated as serfs, nevertheless, even though they were free men who, you know, were offering their services on their own, um, on their own initiative to the state. Um, and uh, it was just, it was a recipe for, uh, you know, betrayal and, and, and disaster because um, 
Ultimately, the state tries to use these uh, private actors thinking that they are, you know, basically arms of the state, but they're not quite arms of the state. They've got their own agendas, they've got their own interests, and in, in a lot of cases, they're bringing in their own capital uh, to fund these um, adventures. So when the state kind of tries to see them or treat them as, uh, you know, soldiers to be ordered around, which they are not, because they don't have the state benefits, they don't have the state, uh, the, all the perks of being a soldier, they just have all the, all the disadvantages, you get a mutiny. So, so I think even that another example that includes the Cossacks mm. is if one thinks of the expansion of the Russian Empire eastwards across Siberia into the Russian Far East. Again, there's a, there's a danger of thinking of this as something that was very much a sort of state initiative, that the Tsars decided, look at all that land, let's go and take it. It wasn't. It was an kind of accretional process, but again, often almost this kind of public-private partnership. You've got, for example, the, the real start of the process was Ivan the Terrible, Ivan the Fourth, grants a chunk of land to the very powerful and rich Stroganov family. But the thing is, it wasn't land that he controlled. It was land that was controlled by the Siberian Khanate. And so the Stroganovs think, well, we still want this land. So they basically hire a private army under, under a Cossack by the name of Yermak to go out and conquer it. And then courtesy of gunpowder and all the other sort of advantages... Uh, of, of a sort of a European state, they're able to go and conquer that. And in a way, that sets the model for the whole slow bit-by-bit bit rolling expansion across you know, Siberia and the Far East. So I think often, exactly, we're coming back to this point about a weak state, that there's a state that frankly can't afford to maintain the kind of government apparatus and particularly military apparatus that it would like and need, and therefore it outsources as much as it can and more or less says, look... We won't really pay you all that much, but we'll also allow you to enrich yourself and aggrandize yourself and prosecute your personal feuds at the same time. You go and do state activities, and we will, as Anna said, claim the credit when it goes well, but then discard you if it goes badly. What's fascinating is, is the historical antecedents of this adhocracy you're talking about and, and present environment stands very much in contrast with what I think the, you know, the collective view of Russia as a vertically integrated top-down dictatorship. I mean, it's much more a personal autocracy, adhocracy, as you're talking about. But you have people like Strelkov, you have, you know, uh, Kadyrov, you have people like, obviously, Prigozhin, obviously very different categories, not to lump them all together. But the system that you're describing is very much in contrast with what a lot of the analysis seems to present today. Russia is um, a paradoxical state. I mean, in the sense of it's, on the one hand, it is a modern bureaucratic institutionalized state like most others. It just happens to have this medieval personalistic court on top of it. And therefore, it, it, this is one, one of the problems. You know, you can get totally fixated with, with the personalia around Putin, who's in, who's out, who's his favorite today and such like. And forget the fact that, you know, the actual day-to-day -day running of the state is in the hands of bureaucrats and technocrats. Or you can obsess about the structures and not realize that, you know, when it comes down to it, ultimately Putin is the decider. And if he has happened, you know, more or less tasks out certain responsibilities to favorites of his. I mean, if one looks at, for example, foreign policy, you know, the foreign ministry handles the bits that no one else really cares about. But if you look at relations towards Syria, it's the Ministry of Defense that basically takes point. If you look at Venezuela, it's Rosneft, you know, notionally it's the corporation, which in effect runs policy. Well, that's because of the fact that it's run by Igor Sechin, one, one of Putin's favorites, and also because of the, the hydrocarbons you know, sort of connection. So I think this is, this is the thing. This is one of the reasons why it's difficult to really get your heads and your hands around Russia, is because it is both modern and primordial. Anna, sorry, I interrupted you. No, 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 no. I, I think that's that's a really important point. But I think from a policy perspective, uh, this leads to a really dangerous misunderstanding. Uh, I think in the United States, we tend to project our own strength onto Russia. The United States is a much stronger society. It's a much stronger country. It's a much stronger state. And we tend to think that if we were a personalistic dictatorship, we would be, you know, all vertically integrated, top-down, incredibly aggressive 
aggressive, really strong, but that says more about us than it actually does about Russia or Putin's regime. And uh, what I hear a lot in uh, American policy circles is this notion that Russia only responds to strength, it only uh, respects strength, and it only, well, yes, to a point, yes, but the trouble is when you're dealing with a what is essentially a fragile and weak autocratic system that is being aggressive to mask that weakness, to compensate for that weakness, then your show of strength is actually going to make it more paranoid, more scared, and more aggressive. Um, and so we, we get into this kind of, um, I, I think this is called the security dilemma, I'm not, but I won't, I won't really go there. I'm not, um, it's not really my, my, my wheelhouse, but you know, I, I, I think this is, this is a very important uh, thing that, you know, needs to be understood. We need to stop projecting our own strengths onto what is in very many ways a fragile, an already fragile regime that is responding to its own fragility. I want to come back to the fragility in, in a second, but I want to return to the, the conversation about the dynamic between Putin and Prigozhin. How did they first basically come into each other's orbits? I mean, Putin, the way this presented is he has a very close inner circle uh, from the St. Petersburg days, and then Prigozhin is a caterer, restaurateur. How did they first interact and how did their interests uh, align? Oh, uh, Mark, you, do you want to take that one? No, no, go, go ahead. <laughs> okay. um it's well uh, yeah it's a, it's a it's a difficult question so it, you know because there's a lot we don't know in that murky world of the 1990s uh when putin was the deputy mayor of saint petersburg uh, and he was also involved as such in kind of mediating between private business and uh the, the public se sector and that included gambling um, so, uh, when Prigozhin was, uh, opening his restaurants, uh, in the 1990s, um, we, we know that he actually made a, he had, uh, a, 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 he, he, he cultivated a friendship with Putin's bodyguard at the time, Viktor Zolotov, who went on to become, uh, the, uh, head of the National Guard, but it is also inevitable that in order to secure some of the licenses, some of the necessary to, you know, get through the red tape and the bureaucracy, know who to bribe, all of that sort of stuff, it is almost, uh, inevitable that, that he came into contact with, uh, members of St. Petersburg City Hall, which included Vladimir Putin at that time. So I think that, uh, and, and, you know, and also there's another dimension here that, that, you know, when Prigozhin was opening his first restaurants, they in some ways became, a, uh, you know, salons for the new uh, business and uh, bureaucratic elites of St. Petersburg, because there were so few of these um, high-level restaurants at the time. Um, I'm pretty sure that uh, people like Vladimir Putin frequented, frequented them a lot. And, um, you know, it's not like we have documented proof, but it's basically been said that it's pretty much well known that, that Putin would, would show up at these places and have dinner there. But this is the thing, you know, unlike some of the overheated sort of discussions, Prigozhin was never Putin's friend. Uh, he, he was a useful political contact, a business contact, someone who clearly funneled money Putin's way in return for this kind of top-level political patronage. But he was, he was a useful contact, nothing more. And that's why you know, he was in this position in which he, he built a whole business empire subsequently, really on, on government patronage, on getting all kinds of you know, government contracts to feed the army, the police, school kids, you name it often very badly at padded prices, because then that, that, that's what having government contacts means. Um, but on the other hand, he always had to be aware of the need to keep the boss, the, keep the czar happy. You know, the, the people who are Putin's friends can, I mean, we usually say get away with murder, and we mean it in metaphorical terms. But anyway, you know, it, they, they have a very, very, uh, shall we say, uh, privileged experience. Someone like Prigozhin actually had to keep precisely running. He had to keep finding new ways of, of, of helping out. And this links all the way through to, to Wagner. I mean, it's, un, it's unclear, but the, sort of the, the classic story about Wagner is that Prigozhin set it up because he saw a market opportunity. In fact, and we don't know the exact truth of the matter, but there is also quite a strong amount of evidence we've uncovered to suggest that, in fact, it was the Kremlin that told Prigozhin 
that you know, they wanted to set up a private military company, but they were looking for someone who was a suitable sort of entrepreneur to front it up, and they landed on him. And he, at first, wasn't particularly keen on the idea. You know, he was already ma making money hand over fist. What did he know about mercenarying? But the, when it came down to it, ultimately, precisely because he was a, a crony in, on the, sort of the outer ring, he wasn't a friend of Putin's, he couldn't say no. And that's where the, the whole sort of trajectory of, of, of the prigozhin wagner relationship developed. Can you talk a little bit about Wagner and its role within sort of the Russian system and how it came about? Because it very much has parallels of uh, you know, almost keeping up with the Joneses in the United States and the leveraging of, of Blackwater and other private military companies of using this as a, as a tool of, of Russian foreign policy, but not directly of foreign policy. Is that an accurate sort of uh, characterization? I mean, I think it is. But again, remember, it's Blackwater as seen through the distorting lens of how Putin and his fellow securocrats sort of saw it. They saw it as being a much, much more direct relationship with the Pentagon and the State Department and so forth, that more or less that Blackwater was just simply exactly, the deniable arm of, of American power. And, look, the Russians had toyed with several times the idea of actually sort of moving beyond their existing private security company sector into the private military company, but never really quite got round to it until actually it seems to have been the sort of the real initiative was a presentation made by the founder of Executive Outcomes from South Africa, who gave a presentation in, in Russia, and that seems to have really sort of sparked interest. And so in 2013, before the revolution of dignity in Ukraine and the, everything kicks off there, they, that's when they seem to have decided that they wanted to have their own PMC exactly as a tool of activity in, as they saw it at the time, maybe the Middle East, maybe Africa, but you know, they weren't thinking of it in terms of a war-fighting institution in Ukraine or anything like that. But then after they'd set it up, things kick off in, in Ukraine, and that's when they decide, ah, huh, no, Wagner has a role to play. And at that point, you know, we see, you know, there's this, again, people always want to have simple answers. And the answer is, you know, is Wagner just simply a deniable arm of the Russian state, or is it a money-making venture by Prigozhin? And the only honest answer is it, it was both. And it moved between those two roles as circumstances permitted. When Moscow wanted it to, that seems almost certain, assassinate various slightly too independent-minded militia leaders in the Donbass, or when initially Moscow wanted ground troops to support the Syrians in the Syrian civil war, it was acting as an agent of the Russian state. At other times, particularly in Africa, essentially it's Prigozhin the entrepreneur who's got a private army he has to pay for and is out looking for suitable gigs to help defray the costs. But when it comes down to it, when the state wants Wagner, then Prigozhin is not in a position to say, I'm sorry, I'm busy with something else. It seems like a, a very fine balance between, for Prigozhin courting upwards, in terms of Putin and the inner circle, but then also characterizing and pursuing his own you know, financial benefits and interests. And it seems to be a very complex interplay there. And I'm curious if we look at you know, going forward with Wagner, because you have him working upwards, almost managing upwards, if you will, but then he becomes very passionate, supportive, and uh, I guess compassion would be the best word for it, for the Wagner fighters, particularly the convicts on the ground, which led to, well, we can talk about the mutiny here, he seems to be wearing a number of masks and not, not talking about the really poor disguises that were found in, in his apartments. But how, what is the real Purgosian under here? I mean, is it just a constant striver trying to become above his station? Is it the, you know, I care about the convicts and the people below me? I mean, where is the real Purgosian in there? I mean, I think all of those things are very, are, are part of a very real Prigozhin. I, I, you know, I, I think that his, uh, you know, as a former convict himself, I saw, uh, you know, lo looking at him and the kind of the emotional, the vitriol that, that poured forth from his um, addresses at the time, you know, uh, that was a real sympathy for these guys that, look, you, you think, uh, 
You think it's easy? You, you want to go fight the war? Fine. Go send your send your rich sons, pull them out of university, and go. Uh, you know, go win this war. We're doing it for you guys like us, and you ignore us, and you um, you don't give us the ammunition. You know, all of this stuff I think was very real, and it comes from, I think, in 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 a sense, Prigozhin's own. Um, identity or part of his identity as somebody who is never going to be quite accepted by polite society um and hence the kind of kind of the anger the the, the righteous anger that uh, came from that but looking at the the mutiny I mean, where did the the conflict the genesis of this friction between Shoigu and Prigozhin, and what ultimately led to the mutiny. Where did this start? Really, it started in Syria, where precisely when the, when the Russians went into Syria in 2015, they were envisaging their campaign as being essentially an arm's length one, that they would just simply provide air power and artillery to support the, the Syrian troops as they turned the tide in the civil war. Very quickly became clear that the Syrian military was in a disastrously bad state and that ground troops were needed to actually help stiffen them. But at the same time, the Russian public was not ready to see its boys come home in zinc boxes from a war in Syria for a regime they didn't care about in a country they didn't know where it was. And therefore, Wagner was used as a deniable arm, but deniable to the Russian people more than anything else. So they could say, no, 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 there happened to be some Syrians, merc you know, Syrian employed mercenaries on the ground, not Russian ground troops though 97% of Wagner was made up of Russian citizens. That's another matter. Once, in effect, Wagner had done its job, once it had helped actually turn the tide and the Syrian military was looking in rather better shape, considering just how expensive it was to field Wagner and the amount of resentment there was amongst the Russian soldiers there to, as they reg regard it, the sort of ludicrously overpaid Wagner operators, the Ministry of Defence decided, well, actually, we'll, 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 we'll cut them loose. Increasingly, they became more or less exactly mercenaries because they, they had a deal whereby they would get a cut of the revenues from whatever oil and gas fields they recaptured. And that led to the infamous Battle of Kasham, in which they were part of a, a, a joint force that was then moving into a, an area with oil fields, going gas fields, um, which happened to be being held by rebels who were supported by the United States. There were U.S. soldiers on the ground. As it became clear that there was this force approaching, the U.S. military command got in touch along its deconfliction line to the Russian headquarters, saying, are these your guys? And they said, nothing to do with us, mate. At which point, a massive amount of American firepower was deployed to very performatively wipe them out. And so, you know, really, that's when it started. As far as Prigozhin was concerned, Shoigu had basically betrayed him. And, to be honest, Shoigu had made it clear that uh, you know, he didn't think that these gopniki, these thugs, uh, chavs, I mean, it's not, not really a word that translates very easily, but these sort of lower class you know, sort of, um, commoners should be the ones to go down in history. And so since then, there had been this sort of simmering feud, which, of course, erupts that much more in, in Ukraine during the war after, after February 2022, particularly because, frankly, Wagner is, in 2022, playing a crucial role. And Prigozhin feels confident. He feels cocky. He feels he can go back to his feuds without realizing that Shoigu is a very subtle and wily political operator. And this is a man who has a political career that predates Putin, after all. And whereas Prigozhin is all sort of bluff and bluster, Shoigu is all about operating behind the scenes. So two parts to follow up to that. One is... Was was the mutiny inevitable? Could it have been avoided, or was this the natural end state of the direction between the conflict? Excuse me, between Prigozhin and Shoigu, and could Prigozhin, in the absence of this you know, mutiny, have ever found a level of success or satisfaction, or was he going to be perpetually striving for more and potentially his ambition outreached his grasp, grasp creating friction for a potential, you know, catastrophic end? I think 
I think nothing is inevitable. And I think this particular mutiny, while the tensions were kind of inevitably there between uh, Prigozhin and Shoigu, I think that uh, this was, in fact, the result of kind of Putin, who habitually tends to recede and sort of abdicate when things get really tough and he has, you know, he's locked between uh, equally unpalatable decisions. He failed to intervene in time between these two figures. Uh, and this is what he normally would do. He would, you know, basically come and sort it out, mediate and um, deflect so that, you know, this kind of remains under the carpet. <laughs> You know, but in this case, it came to the surface, I think, precisely because Putin was really not making, um, he, he wasn't, uh, there were questions, there were things, decisions that needed to be made, and Putin wasn't making them. That left, the, these decisions then fell to uh, Prigozhin and Shoigu, who had to basically answer for things that were not their decisions, the results of their decisions in the first place. But also, it was because Prigozhin was Prigozhin. I mean, just as it's because Putin was Putin. I mean, essentially what was happening is the military had launched a takeover bid for Wagner. And that's what really triggered the mutiny. If Prigozhin had been a little bit less, I would say, steeped in the sort of macho culture still of the prison camp system, he could have decided to, to walk away. To think, OK, well, I will still be rich and powerful but I've been, I will accept that I've been bested once by Shoigu, but nonetheless, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still a player. It just seems to be, I mean, this is not a, a man who on the whole has won his various feuds and rivalries. It seems that he just could not let it go. He could not abandon Wagner, whether it's because he felt it was kind of his rather belligerent baby, or just simply he couldn't accept the notion of losing to Shoigu that he felt he just had to make one last gamble, not to try and topple Putin, but to try and persuade Putin that he was more valuable than Shoigu and to try and sort of renegotiate the terms of, of what had happened. So, you know, it, it required Putin to be Putin, but it also required Prigozhin to be Prigozhin. So in the Times of London, you recently wrote, the Kremlin seems to have neutralized the immediate threat, but rebellions and revolutions are fickle. A spark can ignite the brittle framework of an aging regime. Prigozhin may be dead, but his rise, rebellion, and fall showed the world a fundamental weakness of Putin's rules. Rule, excuse me. Have you seen or are we seeing any other embers of sparks in the regime right now? Well, there's no question but that the Kursk incursion has led to a great deal greater resentment towards Putin. I mean, look, obviously, opinion polling is difficult in a society like this, but people who scan social media for sent you know, indicators of sentiment have noticed this massive upsurge in critical commentary about Putin and about the regime as a result of Kursk. Now, at the same time, there is also a certain rally around the flag element, that at a time when you've got a foreign army on Russian soil, is not necessarily the time to, to express that. And I think generally that, that's a tension that we've seen throughout, throughout the war. But what it is is precisely a kind of a, a building up of tensions. It's a slow delegitimating of Putin. I mean, for me, one of the most fascinating and I think important elements of, of the mutiny was not that it happened, but that when it did happen, so much of the military and security apparatus essentially stood down. They weren't going to back Prigozhin, but nor were they going to do much to stop him. They just thought, well, we'll wait and see. You know, this was a vote of confidence in Putin. They on the whole abstained. So, I mean, I think that, you know, it will be, it will be some kind of black swan unexpected event, Putin getting terribly ill maybe, or an economic crisis that emerges in the regions or something else um, that actually sort of basically brings the next crisis along. But what we have seen is that each crisis Putin moves into, he leaves it a little bit weaker than, than before. So, you know, much as it, I mean, unfortunately, Anna's comment about Putin abdicating got me all excited for a moment. But, you know, <laughs> I, I don't think that we're going to see anything happening anytime imminently. But nonetheless, you know, I, I think we definitely do see a system that is under much greater stress than it was before, and to a large extent because of Putin's own act acts, his inactivities, and his invasion. It's a, it's a metaphorical abdication, uh, not, not, not a real one, but I think it is, we, we have to make that point clear, Putin, this is a trouble, he, he's gonna, he's gonna stay, he's not going anywhere, but sometimes he just doesn't feel like dealing with, he, he's just over everything. 
Oh, I think sometimes we can all relate to that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we're, we're over a year on from the death of Prigozhin. You know, what is his legacy going to be? I mean, how will he be remembered? Will he be remembered at all? Oh, dear. You, I got all the hard questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, this is, uh, this, 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 is, this is the thing. I think that... Um, Look, looking looking to, to, to the future, uh, Putin, sorry, Prigozhin started a conversation that will need to, well, that Russian society will need to have. And it's a conversation about, it's about the war. It's about why did we stage this war? Why did, um, why was this necessary? How are we going to deal with the costs? Um, and it's going to be a conversation between those who uh, thought that this was a good idea and those that thought it was a bad idea. And um, I think the, the Prigozhin's role ultimately was uh, saying certain unspoken truths at, at a time when the Putin regime was unable to say them. And those were that, look, whatever, whatever you may think of the turbo patriots, but they believed, they believed in something. And they believed, long before Putin uh, invaded Ukraine, they believed that uh, Russia needed a more uh, robust and aggressive intervention in eastern Ukraine and Crimea. And they had their reasons for this, uh, whether you agree with them or not. And um, I think that that is um, an honest assessment of uh, you know what happened uh, and an honest conversation between uh, you know the various sectors of society than how they how they felt about this and the the you know the, the I guess the passive majority that feels that this was a mistake and an atrocity, and the active minority that uh, that supported this invasion they're going to have to come to terms with this 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 disagreement and I think that that is a conversation that Prigozhin before his death started and it, at one point it will it will continue hopefully in a much more civil civil fashion. But also since his death Prigozhin has become. A symbol, a very different symbol. I mean, again, the convenience of the martyr is that you get to, to reinvent them. And now, you know, one of the reasons why people leave flowers, sort of, as, as people did, for example, a whole variety of makeshift memorials for the anniversary of his death, is that he has been, in some ways, beatified in death, not as the thuggish backer of mass murderers, but instead as the... Um, working-class patriot who rolled up his sleeves to defend the motherland, doing whatever was necessary, but who was also willing to speak truth to power at a time when no one else is. Now, to be honest, it's not the ideal symbol one would have, but, the, but at a time when... One reason why in the subtitle it's about the new fight for the struggle, for the future of Russia, is because we tended to think about this as being a struggle between Putin and liberals, people who wanted to see something Western and so forth. This is a reminder that there's also going to be a struggle between the Putin system and nationalists, who may not necessarily be some kind of ghastly, imperial, you know, semi-fascistic individuals. They may just simply want to have a strong Russia that is separate, but doesn't have to, have to invade its neighbours. But the point is, there are all these incipient political struggles taking place. Well, I think there's a fantastic spot to end on and look forward to continuing both the conversation about the struggle and the conversation with, with you both. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining uh, me today, Anna and Mark. The book is Downfall. I put it in the camera poorly there. Uh, thanks, as always, to Keelan Wolf, Claude Jennings, and the entire NSI staff for helping produce today's episode. Coffee and Conflict is available on Spotify and other fine purveyors of podcasts. And this episode will be available on YouTube and NSI's webpage. Make sure to join us for our next episode, which will just will take place in just two short weeks. As always, if you like what you've heard or saw, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe. Again, thank you so much, Anna and Mark. Uh, I'm disappointed I didn't get a chance to ask you about my personal favorite uh, person of interest, which is Nikolai Patrushev, but we'll have to save that for a next episode. So thank you so much for joining. <laughs>